in. Okay, we've been looking at a very high level at the notion of just sort of doing area and space planning, just using this notion of areas, this sort of very, you know, kind of almost nebulous notion. It's you've defined some boundaries, it doesn't really depend on walls being there, but it's a good starting point for uh, getting going with your design. What tends to happen though, as the next step in your design, is you'll actually go through and based on your areas, you'll go through and define walls. You'll put interior walls in, you'll go through and start doing your planning, and let's talk about a little bit, you know, what, what we can do at that level to kind of make it uh, still tabulate things and take advantage of the tools available in Revit. Okay, I'm going to go to just the floor plan, not the area plan. The area plans are kind of hanging around down here, level one and level two. I'm just going to go over to uh, level one, phase two, just the floor plan. Can there I have my spaces? So. These spaces right now don't have rooms defined in them. Again, rooms are sort of defined specifically for a phase. So we had defined some rooms in phase one for the first building. We don't have any rooms defined for this phase for this building. So what we can do is define some rooms. I'll grab the room tag. I can put a room here, put a room there, put a room over there, maybe even put a big room over here. These rooms right now are all going to go ahead and show up in the room schedule. So if you scroll on down, we have a room schedule for phase two. Phase one, there's phase two. Here are the different rooms that are assigned right now. And they all have numbers, and they also <laughs> have uh, square footages. Let me kind of show you how we can use this together to kind of make it quick and easy to assign things. Let me, uh, I will go through and... Hang on, let me close the hidden ones. I'll go ahead and open up the floor plan view. What I'm doing with that is I'm always closing the window so I only have one so I can get a second window open. And then I tile them. And that way I see things side by side. This is why you want a gigantic monitor because if you have a gigantic monitor, you don't have to keep on doing all this sort of manipulating to see things. If you have a big old screen, you're fine. So you can sort of see there, there's room one, room two, room three, room four, corresponding to the ones in the schedule. I can change them on either side. It's actually much more common to number my rooms things like, oh, that'll be 101. That'll probably be 102. 103 and 104. Realize that room numbering could actually make a big difference in a building. This building has a very, well, it's almost a clockwise numbering scheme, but some of you probably have had troubles finding rooms in the building before, because it's not entirely straightforward about how to find them, okay? So for each of those, I can assign an occupancy. So room 101, I want to have be an office. Room 102 is also going to be an office. Room 103, let me, that's going to be a meeting space. 104 is going to be, oh, you might call it common space. I can also define those as belonging to departments. That's a, that's a shared <coughs> versus that's a CEE, that's a CEE, and that's an architecture one over there. Okay. As I make these changes in the schedule, it is changing the room objects. You could always see the room object being highlighted over there on the left-hand side. We're not seeing any colors change, though. That's where the color legends help out. If we want to see colors that are based on these different criteria, what I'll do is just scroll on down there a little bit. I will go to the Home tab, and I'll choose, excuse me, I'll choose Legend. I'll bring in a legend, And I can choose which scheme, whether I want to use occupancy or department. Let me do occupancy first. Occupancy will go through and show me common meeting office based on those allocations. Again, if I want to make room 102 instead be a meeting room, I can switch that over just that easily. Make that back into an office. Or if I prefer, instead of showing them as um, what based on the occupancy, I can go ahead and show them based on the departments. So 
I can see the CEE rooms, things like that. Other things you can do while you're in there, let me just edit the scheme. You can, for example, decide, oh, no, CEE, I want to assign a different color to that. So, no, they want to be red. It's kind of pinky. That's a little reddier. Just whatever scheme sort of makes the most sense. And you may have several different copies of your floor plan view showing different versions of the color scheming. So that you have, for level one, phase two, I might have one that shows it sorted out by departments. I might have a different one that sort of shows it sorted out by occupancies. Okay, no problem. But all the data is kind of staying in sync with each other between these schedules and what's going on there. So as you keep on adding details, you'll keep on adding to the schedule. Now, how are rooms determined? Let's talk about that real briefly. Rooms in general, let me kind of click on a room. You see the boundary there? Okay. Rooms generally start wherever you click and go out looking for wall surfaces, and they really look for something that's called a room bounding object. Can okay, most walls are room bounding? Not all walls have to be room bounding, but most of them are. So for example, there's these walls around this little shaft, which are separating it from the rest. I can click on that. It has instance properties, one of which is room bounding. If I would turn that off, you'd see the room would actually go into that space. Okay, so every wall has this co concept of room bounding or not. Floors and ceilings actually have room bounding as a property too. That's how we start to understand the difference between a one-story space and something that actually goes up two stories. And whether a room really includes the total volume of the two stories or whether it actually stops at single height, floor height. And by default, those things tend to be set up as room bounding. That's a pretty good assumption. One case where I often turn off room bounding is, for example, if this were a little closet that I really think should just be allocated to that room, I'll turn off one of the walls as room bounding, and then that space will just be considered part of the bigger space as opposed to really maintaining it as a separate object. Okay, so it's really just you know, whatever makes the most sense. If you want to separate it out, leave it room bounding. If you want to combine some spaces together, make one of the walls not room bounding, and then the, floor, the room will flow between those two different spaces. Okay, that works out pretty well. On the other side over here, we have sort of the opposite condition, though. I have a whole lot of space over here. Maybe my idea is really this is going to be a big open plan space, and I really don't want to do very many walls in that space at all. Okay. If you would like to go ahead and have a big space that's open plan and not put any walls in it, but you still want to think of the spaces as being slightly different functions, you can. Okay. Only instead of putting walls in there, what we'll do is we'll put in what is really you can think of as an artificial <laughs> wall. It's here. Under the room tab, you'll find a room separation line. Okay, that's it's really very much like an area separation line. And whenever we want to subdivide a room, but we don't want to use a wall to do it, just go ahead and put a room separation line in there. Say so that's the naming. That's why I keep on saying area separation lines, but it's area boundary lines. Those two things should be the same name as far as I'm concerned. But it's area boundaries and room separations. But it's really the same basic thing that it's doing. So I can take a room separation line. I can say that, you know, this area down here is going to be a little bit different. I didn't really draw a wall, but I'm going to treat it as a different room. So that is going to be down there, oh, in room 105. That's going to be, I'm going to call it my lounge area. And it's shared. Okay, let me go through, I'll create some other spaces. How about, oh, here's a good example. Very often now we have, oh, cubicles or offices that aren't quite complete. Let's say, for example, Let's pop that over a little. Okay, we have a space over there. That's really going to be like a little office space. It's going to be something which I would really think of more like a hall. And then there's this big space over here. However, I don't want to put a wall separating that space. 
So what I can do is as follows. I'll say room separation line. I'll subdivide that right there. I can also do a little subdivision like subdivision like this. Okay, now I really have two virtual spaces. And let me put a room out there too. It looks like that one doesn't have a room anymore. So now I can say that great, which one? It's this one over here. I'm going to treat that as an office space. Again, if you want a new space that doesn't already exist, you can create a new space or space type. This space over here is going to be the hall. I can probably find it. It's right there. And this space over here is, what is that? That's the uh, social lobby, as we call it in this building. Ah, this, depart this legend is still <coughs> showing by departments. Let me switch that back over so I can show it by uh, occupancy instead. OK, and we can sort of subdivide that space. So just hack, slash, kind of subdivide, create the spaces you need within the building too, okay, to go through and allocate that, you know, doing some space planning to kind of create the different spaces you need. Okay, as a brief diversion, let me go ahead and talk about the issue of complexity and detail and how much you want to show. Because we've been putting some walls in, we've been dividing into spaces, that's all looking good. Yeah. There's a question of really how much detail you can show for a big building like this. Because unlike your research station or that house, which you ever so lovingly put every stick of furniture into, and then you put the decorative accessories on the table, and you made sure there was something nice showing on the TV screen, and you did all these fantastic things to really kind of explore that and you know, demonstrate it for the clients. For a building like this, you probably can't and wouldn't go through and furnish everything in great detail. Really, for big spaces like this, it's actually much more common to think of them. They're really a bunch of office spaces. So I can go through and keep on adding. Another office pier. There's another office over here. That's looking really bad, so let me align those. <laughs> AL for a line. Oops, that goofed. AL for a line. Why? Why me? <laughs> Hang on. I could control Z to undo. Uh, we separate those out a little. Align this to that. Okay, now I'll stick them back together again. Sometimes when things are joined together, it, you have to sort of unjoin them to move them relative to each other. OK, so I got some different offices there. As you go through and work, you will go through and put things like doors into your offices. Go through and think about that. Doors are pretty easy to go through and put in. You need to sort of give access to the space. I'll put a door in and flip it. I'll put a door in and flip it. I'll put a door in, maybe on this side on this one. Looks like this one needs an inner door too. <coughs> we'll get around that shaft. OK, so I got some basic spaces in there. You will probably also go through and put a little bit of furniture in. But again, don't think about putting all the furniture in. For example, if I were creating an office space, I would probably approach it at this level of detail. I would go through and place a component that represents the desk, just because that really helps me understand. This might be a faculty office, so I'll put a big old desk in here. OK, oh, let me go through and I will put in some chairs too. I'll place some components. There's a desk chair right there.
Maybe I'll put two chairs in front. Come on, get the second one in there. I'll think about why that's not placing in just a second. Great. And then I will go through and place another component, maybe like an executive chair at the back. Uh, and for that, I'll go out and load one. I have a chair. It's a nice executive chair. It has some arms on it. It's funny why arms make it an executive chair. But it seems to, way to be the way we define it. I can rotate that. Okay. <coughs> At some level, that little furniture grouping is replicated all over the building. If you go throughout this building, you'll find that basic furniture grouping is replicated in like 50% you know, of the offices. We often have a little credenza or some file cabinets in here too, but it tends to work this way. We have standard size office spaces, then we come up with standard furniture configurations for each of those offices, and we go placing them in those different offices. Okay, a very similar thing happens in hotels. If you've gone to a hotel, there's always that, are you gonna get a king size bed or two queen size beds? The rooms are actually exactly the same size. There's just furniture configuration A and there's furniture configuration B. And at some level, someone doesn't go through and design all that out in great detail room by room. They make A and they make B and then they put it in the different rooms. Okay, and I'll show you how to do that here. So here's the idea. We got these guys hanging around. We got a chair. I'm gonna add a selection, which includes those two little visitor chairs. I can go through and do something called create group where I can give that a name. Let me go ahead and call this Office Config A. And the nice thing about grouping things like that together is as follows. I can copy and put it right next door here. Well, over here, maybe I want to put it on the other side. I can copy this one and put it over here. I can even go ahead and copy it here into this office. And maybe in this one, I'll actually rotate it like that. Now, this office over here is a pretty big one. So maybe in this one, I'll even copy that and put it over here too. The idea is you don't want to place all those tables and chairs independently. You really want to just sort of have a group like that. And why do we like to have something like that? It's as follows. We can go through and edit that group. And if we decide to change something about it, for example, instead of having a, a two chairs, I can only afford to have one visitor chair now. I can finish that group and everyone inherits that change. Okay, so much, much better to go ahead and create these little subcomponents, these groups, and go through and do it that way. Okay, because then all the different elements, yeah. So An excellent question. Perfect, let's go ahead and show you. I will choose one of those groups. Notice it's in Office Configuration A. That's actually a type. Okay, if I go through and look at the instant or the type properties, you'll see it's Office Configuration A. Like most things, if I don't like that, I'll just duplicate the type and make B. Now, so far, A and B look an awful lot alike, so you can't tell the <laughs> difference. But I can now edit B. Finish B. Okay, And now it's as easy as if I choose that one, you want A or B. Okay, so you're important. You get the B configuration back here. You're not so important, you only get the A configuration there. 
Okay, so this grouping and this repeating of things can be incredibly handy for just quickly furnishing something because you'll probably come up with some standard configurations. In a conference room, you'll have a six person conference room, you'll have a 12 person conference room. You know, in offices, you'll have the big executive desk for the uh, faculty member, you'll have three smaller desks for the student researchers. You, you have these standard configurations and you can real quickly pop back and forth, only defining them once. Yes, for some. When you create a group, you're actually making a family. I guess you're enforcing a big component from where the student you know, multiple objects. Yeah. I think that's a good way to look at it. You're really creating a family that only exists within this one project. Okay. But no, that's a very good way to look at it. It has all the same attributes. You choose a type and it switches between the different configurations. It's repeatable. Yeah, it really is like a local family. I think that's a good analogy. Okay, so as you go through and complete your assignment, be thinking about how you can use grouping to get the big objects in there. Now really, for your offices, a group that just gets repeated is sufficient. We don't really need to sort of think about the layout of every individual office. Some spaces, like your student center space, if you really want to kind of show some sort of a unique notion about how the seating's gonna work in there, or how the cafe space is gonna work, go ahead and love that detail and spend the time furnishing that and putting components in some of those spaces. But if I've got 30 offices, you can sort of just do one. You can copy it. You, know, you, you don't want to worry about all of those in great detail. Okay, so a standard configurations will really save you a lot of time. Okay, make sense? Beautiful. Okay.